Are we there? Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Live at Five. I am your pure dog talk host, Laura Reeves. I'm super excited to have you guys all join us. <clears throat> and while everybody is hopping on, I have a couple items, as they say, for the good of the order. In case you haven't heard, recently we launched a new, very, very cool opportunity to access the archives on the Pure Dog Talk website that are, you know, a lot of people don't even know they're there. Um, and so when you see the 200 and some odd episodes on your iTunes and you're like, wow, you don't realize that there's 575 episodes, right? Okay. So I've done all the searching and the hunting and the pecking for you. And for the lovely introductory price of only a buck 99, you can download an entire album and they're sorted by topics. So breeding and whelping, the hands-on stuff, right? Pure Dog Talk University on dog breeding. All of the five years worth of veterinary voice episodes. Owner handler focused episodes. Love the breeds. So individual breed um, discussions with experts, real serious actual experts in each of the breeds. Tons more. So check that out. 100% worth it. While you're there shopping, don't forget their swag. There's an ebook. I mean, if you need to spend some money, I got you. All right. You can also join up, sign up, join up, what else? Um, sign up to join our exclusive patrons group. So we have a private Facebook group that you can only get if you are a paying patron. And once you join that, your additional perk is our weekly pure pep talk text messages. I'll send you out an upbeat, fun, educational little tidbit. And you can sign up for the patrons group including the pep talk messages for as little as, I mean, 10 bucks a month. I, you know, there's a lot of mentor programs out there that are going to cost you a whole lot more than the price of a couple drinks at your favorite coffee stand. That's all I got for you. And that's for a month. So if you haven't submitted your request for the pure dog talk patrons badge already, shoot us an email. Um, we can get that out to you if you email us at team at pure dog Always remember, more support gets you more access. So, you know, that's a thing. We also have three separate patrons retreats scheduled for this year. So be on the lookout. Promos for those are going to start going out soon. Our first up is going to be in July in Tacoma uh, with the Tacoma Kennel Club show. And we are planning to have a self-defense course specifically designed for women, although open to anyone. Um, I think something that is really, really, really important for all of us that are out there traveling around all over God's creation with our dogs. So that's something to keep an eye out for. We've streamlined a lot of the offerings for our patrons, right? We've grown the all access patrons group to a community network that includes judges and breeders and experts and exhibitors. It's not just me answering all your questions. There's a lot of smart people in there and we all have the same goal. Okay. Cause your passion, that's our purpose. So check it all out on the website at puredogtalk.com. Meanwhile, it's summer. June 6th has arrived. It is a dog show bonanza and many of you guys are going to be headed out to your first or maybe one of your first shows in the next few weeks. For me, we are headed to Woofstock. I will be groovy. We will be having a grand time. Hope to see a bunch of you there. If you're there, stop by and say, Hey, um, so first of all, drop your questions in the chat. If this is your first dog show and you don't know the etiquette or you don't know what to do about whatever, Drop it in the chat. We can answer it that way. 
Next, you can also click the link that Natalie is going to drop for you. And you can join me live right here on video to ask your question or offer a suggestion. This is new this month. I've been really wanting to get to this. So I'm super excited that we're finally getting it done. First of all, our first up um, guest is going to be my, my good friend, my dear patron, Natalie, who just, who's also working behind the scenes. So give her a little minute. She's like, you know, I'm saying she just survived and thrived, I might add, at her first AKC dog show with her homebred Anatolian Shepherd, Aries, who is a real live, actual working livestock guardian dog. And she showed him, amongst other things, to an owner handled group one at the Missoula dog show. I mean, and since this was her local Aubrey club, she was also put in charge of the grooming setups and learned a ton about how dog shows work behind the scenes. So that's something I encourage everybody to do. Meanwhile, hey, hey, how you doing, Natalie? I'm going to unmute myself. I'm good. How are yeah, you? Yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought you were the perfect intro, the perfect segue. We've been having some great conversations in the patrons group that I hope to, to um, kind of carry forward here talking about what's the proper etiquette for this, that, and the other thing when you're new and you don't know all the answers, we got them for you. But I thought your experience at your show this weekend was just so, just so amazing that I really needed to share it. So tell us all about it. Well, I didn't breed him, but he's my son. You didn't breed him. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, you have read them, just not this one. Not not this one, yeah. He's he's made others <laughs> here. Um yeah, Aries, he's he's a working livestock guardian dog, not a show trained dog. Like I'm not a show trained human. He's also not a show trained dog. So we were a very exciting match. Um basically I just let everyone know that I had no idea what I was doing and set real low expectations up front. I think that helped. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> helped that helped your mindset. That's great. Yeah. I love your win photo where you had to face him the other direction because he was not going to quit looking at the dogs that had all circled around behind you because he was guarding you. Well, people, I don't, he, he like they're off duty when they're off proper, but he was very not comfortable with all the confused people mm -hmm. and their dogs who were like, what breed is that? They don't come right. in that color. All, all of that was going on. Plus, like, right. did he really give an Anatolian a group one? Um, so, you know, it was it was commotion. That was not uh, his jam. <laughs> Right, right, so, right. I mean, yeah. he is a livestock guardian dog working on talk about your property and your and your livestock that he's working. Today. Oh, yeah. No, he's out there. Um, yeah, we have a uh, hair sheep and cooney cooney pigs and a Jersey cow and endangered cotton patch geese and a mixed flock of chickens and two humans that I'm fond of. Um, so <laughs> children. Yeah. Yeah, the, the kids. He's responsible for that yep. as well. So, because yep. uh, I can't be, so someone else has to do that. Um, so, I mean, I'm pretty sure you drive him to the to school. I I don't think Aries is that good. If I can train him to drive them, I I would, for sure. <laughs> We're working on it. We're not there yet, but someday oh maybe. <laughs> But oh no, he, we have um, a little over 10 acres. We're at the base of a mountain between like basically Forest Service and a year-round creek. So it's a very high traffic zone for ungulates, which is just like deer and elk and all that stuff. And then everything that likes to eat them. And everything yes. that likes to eat them would also really love <laughs> to eat whatever I have out, out there. Heirloom, so. heirloom livestock, right. Got yeah, they, they taste better because, you know, they're organic. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so he's got a job. Him and his ladies have a big job. So um, black bear, grizzly bear, gray wolf, mountain wow. lion. Wow. Coyotes aren't a problem because they're just running from the wolves. So that's yeah. nice. That, that, no one ever tells you the good part about wolves is that the coyotes don't bother you. So okay. there's that. All right. All right. <laughs> 
So, so tell us your top three things that you learned at your very first AKC dog show this weekend, including the fact that you were the grooming chair. <laughs> oh God. Um, it's like the military, I guess. Like don't volunteer for something if you don't know what you're doing. Cause you'll end up doing it even though you have no idea what you're doing. Help the, ch- well, it, that's how I got entrapped. I volunteered to help the chair who then got very pregnant and had a baby, a human baby. And then I decided that she should not be bending over on the floor taping. Probably the floor. Not. So Probably. then I somehow became the chair. Well, Magic. that's what happens. You raise your hand and you're in charge, man. <laughs> Oops. Um, it's, okay. it's good. It's a good learning experience. Yeah. And the feedback was generally good until all the power started going out. That's a problem. But that wasn't your fault. No, no, I didn't do it, but um, I got to deal with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it was good. It was a very uh, into the hot frying pan directly. I think situation. that's amazing. I think yeah. that's totally amazing. Yeah, it was, it was good. Uh, it wasn't that bad. It was really bad before the show. Then the first day of the show was super stressful. And then after that, it seemed all downhill from there. That's pretty much a legit. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> It does get better. Don't give up the day before it starts, I promise. Yeah, yeah, don't do that because then people will just be mad at you. <laughs> um, so talk to us about winning um, the inner handle group. Like, what was it the second time you walked in it? Oh, well, I was confused. Um, he pointed at me and my friends were like, go, go. And I was like, where? What do I? <laughs> um, so... And I thought at first I was like, oh, he's making a cut because I'm like, manage expectations. Um, So I went and like tried to line up on the diagonal like he was making a cut. And he's like, no. And I'm like, I'll wait. And he's like, no, one. (laughs) So, um, you know, (laughs) pay better attention than me. I have to I have to say I was actually on a panel with that judge in Southern California the weekend before. He's lovely. He's lovely. He's from Australia. He's a very nice man. Super um, nice. I was riding. I was riding in a car with him and a couple other of the judges. Um, one of the days, and one of the judges was British, and he was Australian, and I was afraid we were about to have, I don't know, some like international incident because <laughs> <laughs> he was teasing her, and they were. And they, oh, it was it was real, man. <laughs> yeah. He. He was great, though. He told me to just forget about the sheep. If they get eaten, they get eaten and just show the dog. And I was like, sir, I appreciate that. But (laughs) those are expensive sheep. Uh, (laughs) So uh, we'll see. But but yeah, no, he was he was super nice. And and I got to see him later in the show. He, He helped me. He showed me how to stack him properly after the picture because he checked his schedule and saw that he wasn't doing anything else with working group at all. So, so once, once they're not going to be around you for the rest of the cluster, they can actually talk to you if they want to, they don't have to, but he was very, very kind. I do it all the time. So (laughs) yeah, he, he showed me that he's like, pinch the back of the leg right here. If you want more angulation. And I was like, pro tip, look at you. So nice. There's a podcast for that, just in case you were wondering. I know, but it's different when you, like, yeah, someone's like, look at where my hand, hand is. On. And, and another pro tip, these are the kind of things we get at the patrons retreats. So I'm yes. super excited for, for more of those opportunities because yeah. it's just the nicest guy. So I love that. Absolutely yeah. love that. It was good. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and as long as you. the poodle people don't lose power, everything will be okay. Yeah, that's that's a legitimate concern. Keep that, the no, poodle people in power. I, I will tell you the, <laughs> the podcast interview that I did where I had Allison fully come and talk about um, going to Europe and doing up dogs in Europe and the poodles. I mean, they don't have power. You do your poodle up with a brush and a spray bottle. Oof. Like. <laughs> that sounds just, awful. Like, but... <laughs> okay. Oh, I can't even. Yeah, it's a lot of work, oh no matter how you do it, I think. But yeah. if they can yeah. have power, they, they, they need it. Yeah, they definitely. Well, everybody needs it. But I, I think the poodle people 
definitely certainly feel as if they need it more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> It's a lot of hair. Oh my gosh. Well, so Natalie, thank you. Thank you, yeah. everybody. Um, Natalie is also the person behind the scenes who makes these lives happen. So give Natalie a big shout out because I'm I'm kind of a walk in disaster area. And if it wasn't for Natalie, I couldn't accomplish much of this. So thanks, babe. All right, excellent. So Heather, um, I see your comment here in the in the in the chat. Everybody keep in mind, if you want to come on the video, you are 100% welcome. Natalie's going to drop you a link and you can join up just like she did. Um, Heather asked, um, after the owner handler group, the judge pulled her aside and said that he liked my dog, but that um, I lost his top line. And does that mean I overstretched him? He's a Bracco. Um, I would say that's probably a pretty good guess. Uh, Bracco and Spinoni, for those who are unfamiliar, have a two-part top line, and it's a really important and critical piece of breed type. And so if you pull the dog up too much in the front, stretch it too far in the back, do a lot of things, you will, this is one of those things, you can have the best dog in the world, your presentation matters, right? And if the judge can't see what the dog is because of your presentation, then that then that's on you, not on the judge or on the dog. So it's possible you overstretched him. It's possible that you had him pulled up too tight in his, um, in his neck. That's the thing that I will see pull a dog out of a top line. Really common, really common people who are accustomed to showing sporting dogs when they show a Bracco or an Italian or a Spinone, they really want to just pull them up right? You know, get the neck up, get the ears up. No, 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 no. <laughs> My explanation to everyone that ever helped me with the Spinoni was um, no ears, no tail. And yes, their back is supposed to look like that. So if you're presenting a Spinoni or a Bracco, you're going to not pull them up on the collar if you can help it. You're going to use your hand here in that V in their chin. Okay. And you're going to hold their head there. And you're going to make sure that the divided dewlap shows because that's also another important piece of breed type. And so it is so incumbent upon us as handlers and exhibitors to showcase the very unique and breed specific components of our dogs. That's what we're there to do. And knowing what those are is part of your job as the exhibitor. And so I would guess, Heather, that yes, you, you either pulled his rear too far back or you pulled his head too far up. And those are two things that will basically flatten out the top line in, in a breed that should not have a flat top line. There is a distinct break there. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Renee Wagner, I, I say I want the bloodhounds to look dead inside. <laughs> That's beautiful. This is 100% right. 100% right. No ears. Um, many of our breeds that have a low ear set, um, it's it's so hard because we're like, oh, we want to show everything like the quintessential Doberman, right? And I, I don't mean to pick on Dobermans. They're overly picked on. But, but too often we lose track of breed-specific presentation and aim for a generic presentation that is a disservice to our dogs, a disservice to our breeds, and a disservice to our sport. So show your dog in the way that the standard is written to make them look like they should look. And, and, you know, maybe you'll lose, maybe you'll win, but you should show that dog the way it should look. Dead inside. I like that, Renee. <laughs> um, okay. I see another one up here on the screen uh, that Natalie put up for me. Newbie question. What if I'm the only entry in my breed? Oh, what a great question. After we show to the breed judge, do we go get to go to groups? Is that considered a first or a best of breed? And are we then eligible for points in the group ring? Can you explain the rule change this year regarding points? hundred percent. I can explain it really personally because <laughs> we had um, just a, a really beautiful Spinone puppy that we had placed in a really fabulous home and she was very excited and we'd work very carefully with her to have get this dog ready to be shown at the national 
He was going to be just the right age to show in the puppy sweeps and the puppy classes. And we were so excited and she wanted to get him out and get him socialized. Very important. So she was so careful. She took him to all the dog shows where she expected to not have competition because a seven month old champion at a national specialty. Well, cool is not as competitive as you might want it to be. Right. So she worked very hard, very hard, very hard. And she took her dog, her puppy to a dog show where she did not expect additional competition. He won the breed from the classes. That was great. Not a problem. He only got a single point. No big deal. Went into the owner handled and into the regular group and received a regular group two, which finished him <laughs> because the new rule change is that used to be if you win the group you got the same point total as the highest points available in that group of the dogs that you defeated now that applies my understanding and somebody correct me if i'm wrong that applies now for first through fourth so if you win fourth place in the group and left standing not in the ribbons is a golden retriever or a, 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 a labrador or something that had a huge major um any breed that had a major you would you would be awarded the same number of points as whatever the highest award in any breed in that group that you defeated okay so that's the rule change it absolutely applies to first place and second place, and I believe, and I haven't looked at this super carefully, but it's my understanding it applies to third and fourth as well. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. And yes, you are eligible for points in the group ring. So if you are the only ent entry in your breed, and assuming that your dog is deemed worthy by the judge, that is a thing. Judges may choose to withhold. I don't know anything about your dog. I'm saying that's a thing. But assuming you receive your purple and gold best of breed ribbit, ribbon, you are then eligible to compete in the regular group. If you have checked the owner handled box, you are eligible to compete in the owner handled groups. So you will get first place winners if you are not already a champion and then also uh, best of breed. Okay. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, Yes, Emily, that is, that is exactly correct. That is a very brand new thing that just started this year. Um, as I said, it used to be, it only happened if you won the group. Now it, um, is, as I understand for all of the uh, group placements in every group. Yeah, Renee, it was, it, I mean, how can you be mad? It's what you call a high class problem when you have a seven month old champion. I mean, <laughs> you can't really be mad about it. He's a beautiful dog, but we really had so carefully planned. <laughs> so yeah, I, I can tell you for sure it's real for first and second. And I'm, I'm given confidence that it's also um, true for third and fourth. So, you know, if you're at a, a small dog show, there may be no majors, right? You just have to go to the superintendent and check and find out. So that is a thing. All right. Does anybody else have anything? Otherwise I'm going to riff on a topic. Yep. Okay. Group three. Good, Cindy. I, that's what I thought. I thought I was pretty sure it was first through fourth. Um, Ian Beck, Ian Beck, you want to come on the air? Click that link that Natalie just put up because you had a really interesting conversation starter in the patrons group. And I was wondering if you wanted to join and, and we can have you up here and talk about it. Um, Yep, exactly. Emily and we all, I mean, everybody needs time. The dog needs time. It's hard to find classes. They're really expensive handling classes, but you know, but yeah, I mean, take your dog, train it up, show it, win a prize, get a point. Um, right, right. Renee, I understand a hundred percent. Um, okay. Ian isn't going to join us. All right. So the conversation that I thought was a really interesting one um, is sort of a, a nuanced conversations, but it's a really good nuance for people who are new to, um, dog shows. So the idea is that in primarily this occurs in the more rare breeds, right? The low entry breeds, we think of them. Um, the idea that 
you know, there's multiple dogs entered. It's finally a major for the first time in a year in your breed. And you're so excited and your dog wins the major. And then another competitor asks you to keep your dog in the classes to compete so that their dog can have a chance to win the major. And could you kind of show down, right? Or throw it a little bit or, you know, give the other dog a chance to win the major. And, and it was, was a really, really good, really well thought out conversation with people on both sides of this uh, topic, talking about that that's just not something they're comfortable with, or yes, this is something I absolutely would do for X, Y, and Z reason. And so I thought I'd lay out both sides of it and you guys chime in in the comments or hop on air if you would like to do that. Um, oh, there we go. We got Ian. Hey. <laughs> hey, Ian, how you doing? Good. Excellent. So you do you and I'll do me. We'll be the, we'll be the two sides of this conversation. I think it'll be perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you go. This was your, this was your topic. I think you think, so I think you should get to leave. Have a chance to win the major. Oh, just mute. Oh, you kind of. It's okay. Okay. Just mute the Facebook. There you go. I'm gone. Okay. Sorry. All right. All right. So tell me your, tell me your thing. Tell me what you think. Um, I think I take myself entirely too seriously. I was helping out <laughs> covering a dog. Um, and I was told to, you know, the bitch needed the crossover. The winner's dog had just finished. And like, I'm still so new to this that every time I go in the ring, I want to be on like 110% on my game. So it just like felt really weird to be asked to do that. And it's different, I guess I could see it's different in larger breeds where that are more, you know, popular versus like our breed, which is Finnish Lapoon, which is a more rare breed. That was just like really foreign to be asked to do this. <laughs> um, and I think, I mean, that's also a common thing, you know, like, you know, slow down, don't, you're not gunning for best in show here, just like see if we can't get the crossover, right? Um, and I get that. And I get that it's really hard to, not want to win everything. I, as I said at the time, I am the worst losing loser that you've ever said. Like I can't, I can't do it. I understand it, but I also understand. I can remember from, I mean, I guess burned in my memory is from when I was a little kid and we were showing the clumbers that were my parents, you know, my family's breed and clumbers at the time, particularly were really rare. It was almost impossible to get majors. And we had built this major up and my, my puppy, my puppy, right, had finished. And I was so excited. I wanted to move her up to the breed. And it was a professional handler who had one of the other dogs. And she requested, so it's the first time I'd ever heard this. I'm like, you know, 17, 18 years old. I'm like, what? Uh, no, <laughs> I want to win, right? And and so it, it took me a minute and we kind of worked through it. And I was a kid, so it was even worse, right? Like you're a grown up adult, you know, I was little. And um, we worked our way through it and it was a really valuable lesson for me. We, you know, got a friend's son to show her and she still almost won. And I mean, the kids got the leash trailing on the ground. And I mean, it was not artful, right? And the bitch was such quality that she still almost won, right? So judges see through some of that. Um, and I think for me, it's more about, I understand we always are competitive. We didn't come into this sport because we weren't competitive, right? Isn't that your feeling? Like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and talk to me about some of the other comments that I thought were really insightful that, you know, it feels like a disservice to your breed. Like we really dug into this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think looking back and having a couple of days to kind of think about this and, you know, talking to friends who are handlers and getting their insight. Cause I very much try to model what I have to, what I do off of what handlers do. Cause I want to give that really polished, you know, right. image. Um, when we finished our dog, which is a rare breed, we had a major and we went to the rest of the exhibitors who we would have broke the major for. And he said, what do you want us to do? We can move him up or we can keep him back and just show him down and kind of put it in their lap and let them decide what they wanted to do. 
I'm not unconvinced that Foster wouldn't just free stack his little heart out, even if I didn't show him. So exactly. I think that that was like that situation was the easiest as far as like breaking the major by, you know, kind of going back to your community and talking to them. Um, but it definitely is something that just seems to be common. And we've all been there or know people that's been there that, you know, we just need that major. Like we just need that major. The dog has 20 points, but no major. Um, right. So, and sometimes, yes, yeah, sometimes there's a reason for that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yes. Um, and I will tell you, honestly, this is what I tell people most often, 98% of the time, if you play this game long enough, and it is a game, right? You guys understand that. Yes, it's serious business. Yes, we have a serious purpose, but we're also basically in a sport. That's a game. And so if you play the game long enough, you come to understand that sometimes you win when you shouldn't, and sometimes you lose when you shouldn't. And over the course of time, those things even out. And and the For ones sure. that when you lose when you shouldn't, and those feel really, 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 really bad until a few times you win when you shouldn't, you're like, <laughs> and and understanding the difference right like you should be able to know as you go through this i really shouldn't have won that like the the dog didn't deserve that right and so that knowledge helps right understanding your breed knowing your breed knowing the competition walking in the ring and saying okay my dog should be between first and third, depending on what they prioritize, or I'm so in deep doo-doo, <laughs> or I'm walking out of here, right? I mean, these are the things that we should be aiming to understand, right? As we yeah. gain knowledge about our breeds. And so yeah. I love that you thought about that, that that was hard for you. <laughs> and I love that you had the right instinct when you finished your dog and went back to the community. I think that was perfect. Right. And it sounds to me like it was a lot easier for you when it was your idea to offer it than when someone asked it of you. Yeah, it was just and it was just a different circumstance. And, mm -hmm. you know, going back to what you were talking about with, um, you know, knowing where you should fall and like sometimes you shouldn't get the win and you get the winner feeling like I think it's really important to especially in like smaller rare breeds to show the dog in the way that you like that represents you and makes you happy and accept that some judges are going to love that and some judges aren't but you have to like what you're doing at the end of the day yep. and you have for to our like breed, your dog you have to like the game yeah and we don't have like our breed we don't have a lot of breed specific handling we really don't have a lot of professional handlers so kind of paving your own way is okay too yeah i love that though i think that's really awesome and I happen to think Lapins are just freaking adorable. Like, I don't want to live with one, but I think they're cute over there. <laughs> they're pretty awesome. <laughs> I think they're fabulous. All right. Well, Ian, thank you. Thank you for being a patron. Thank you for joining us on the video tonight. Thank you for your thank insight you. and your thoughts. I love it. Love thank you. it. Okay. Um, let's see. Avery Lisk had a really great question <clears throat> that I wanted to circle back to. Um, she asked, is it, or I'm sorry, Avery asked, can't put a gender on that one. So I'm not going to, is it okay to ask, ask people questions at shows? It's not while they're in the ring. Good call. But while they're there, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Absolutely. Talk to people, talk to exhibitors when they get done, talk to handlers when they're not busy, talk to the judges after they're done judging and they have, you know, a time to think talk to people that's how you learn um you, it's not like it's by osmosis you know it's not like you stand there and the and the information just goes into your brain i mean you know, that is exactly 100 percent what you should do and and i think you know from what you're saying obviously not while they're in the ring the other caveat i would add to that avery is to watch that people are not busy getting ready for the ring Right. So people tend to get in a real, you know, we were just talking to Ian, right? It's this really competitive headspace that you get into. And so I think that that's people tend to be, I was known famously to have what <clears throat> might be referred to as resting bitch face could have happened. 
because I was so focused. Right. And so, um, let people have their moment and then they'll let down and then they will be more than happy to talk to you. What do people want to do more than anything in the world? Talk about their breed. So I mean, that's just, I know I can put a quarter in me. I can spend hours and hours and hours and hours talking about my breeds. Most people are the same way. I assume everybody here is the same way. So ask people questions, ask to learn, right? So don't ask to be, um, confrontational, but ask to learn. And those are the questions that are absolutely going to get answered hundred percent of the time. Okay. Janet, it is an individual decision for sure. And, um, it just, I, I agree. It depends. And so for me, I think about my childhood moment when it was really hard for me to, to not move my dog up to best of breed. I finished her. She was my dog, right? I was a kid. And I remember how that felt. Um, and it felt really hard, but it also felt really, really good, um, to help somebody else. And that handler that I helped that day became one of my longest term, dearest friends and mentors in the sport. So there's that, what comes around goes around thing that I think really matters. So, um, yep, absolutely. All right, Emily, what do you got? I think Emily needs to come up here. She's, she's got lots of questions. Uh, should I even consider the judges I'm showing to? I know people have all kinds of opinions about certain judges. I'm in Lakeland. I assume that's Lakeland Terriers. Yes. I hear a lot of that judge doesn't know the breed. I want to keep a positive attitude always, but is that too Pollyanna? Okay. Emily, I have to tell you if I could, if I had a nickel for all the times I have been called Pollyanna, I could retire and y'all could have your own podcast. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, I, I pretty much adhere to Pollyanna there's that. Um, I think that keeping a positive attitude is the right way to go. I think that there will be negative things in life in every single part of life. Dog shows are no exception to that rule. And that as in every single thing in life, if you focus, if you concentrate on the positive and not the negative, your life will be happier. Basic bottom line. Um, I, I have personal experience with this and have done a lot of work personally on this topic and it really matters to me. And you can look at every single, every single interaction, every single thing in your life, in your day as positive or negative, And it is your choice. I mean, I, I blew a front tie rod coming off the freeway in my sprinter van into town, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, my choice could have been, oh my God, you know, that's a billion dollar fix. And oh my, and my choice was, oh my God, I am so glad that happened here and not, <clears throat> you know, 20 miles ago when I was going 65 miles an hour next to a 600 foot clip. So always choose the positive Pollyanna or not. It will make you happier. And I don't care what everybody else thinks. Um, and so to answer your original question, should you be considering the judges you're showing to? Um, I think that you should take note of them. If you're new, you don't have a lot of experience with what a judge likes or doesn't like. And I am inclined to be of the opinion that your information is better than anybody else's information. I mean, ask questions you know, get their input. But, um, I think it always depends on the source and sometimes it can be hard even to <clears throat> evaluate the source of the information. For example, there is a place called, um, actually, no, I'm not even going to say its name. There is a place in, um, Facebook land that does this sort of thing. And I, I am violently opposed to it because I don't believe it is a useful tool. And I think it is a tool in which people spread rumors and, and sour grapes. So my suggestion, Pollyanna that I am is go show your dog right now. Just go show your dog, man. Um, I really think that there is no harm, no foul. You're learning the dogs learning. Keep notes. When I was a little kid, starting from the time I was like 13, I kept notes on every judge I showed my dog to 
which dog won, which dog didn't win, what I thought maybe they were looking for. Maybe I was wrong, maybe I was right, but that's what I thought they were looking for. Um, how they handled, handled their ring, anything like that. And understand that every single judge in the stratosphere of judges has um, a picture of every breed that they judge in their mind's eye, right? So what does a beautiful, you know, X, Y, or Z breed look like in my mind's eye, I can pull up the snapshot of X, Y, or Z dog. And that's a beautiful one of it. And I'm going to judge because that's the dog that I think represents the standard, right? Okay. So until you know, you know, this judge is for sure interested in X and not in Y, they like this style and not that style. I mean, Lakelands are a pretty nuanced breed. They're a pretty detail oriented breed. I personally would, would not presume to pass judgment in the breed on, on Lakeys. Um, so I think that finding people, one of the ways that you can do research of your own is when you look at a judge coming up on a panel, you can go to AKC, um, searchable judges directory and his name and it will pull up their original breed and so i think specifically lakelands most of our terrier breeds are so nuanced and, and detail oriented that finding someone who comes from terriers or from a breed that has a lot of nuance to it is is going to give you a good head start that's that's kind of a safe bet right um so that would be my suggestion. Uh, pay attention to the judges, keep track of the judge notes on the judges, but don't obsess about it and don't go on that Facebook place and don't necessarily listen to just whatever random human walks by tells you about a judge. Okay. Um, Ian's advice here is super, super great. Give a judge a chance three times. Um, if you have a great performance and they still don't pick that style of dog, Maybe stop showing to him after three times, but so many times we're quick to say the judge didn't like my dog and he was perfect, but there's so many little details that make or break a performance. That is a hundred percent true. And it depends on the competition. So I could look at Ian's dog today in this particular lineup and it would be fourth. And I could look at Ian's dog a month from now and that particular lineup and say it's first, right? So competition matters. What are the dogs in the ring with you? If they're better than your dog, probably not going to win. If they're not as good as your dog, you probably are going to win. <laughs> um, so that's a thing. Um, participating in judges education in some breeds is great. In other breeds, it's more difficult, Renee. There are many, many breeds um, for which exhibitors are not um, actually invited to participate. Um, and so one of the things that I think is super important is to um, find out from your national club if you're going to go to the net a go to the national okay number one go to the national <laughs> number two find out if exhibitors are allowed to participate in judges education if you can it is an amazing opportunity don't talk don't run your mouth just listen um, if not ask if they have an exhibitor education opportunity many clubs will or will provide one if people ask for it and it is so, so valuable, particularly as you're just getting into a breed, if you're just really trying to learn nuanced stuff, I think that is an amazing opportunity and you learn what the parent club is telling the judges in the education and you can read the standard all you want, but until you tell hear what the parent club actually tells the judges, um, there's some, there's some definite nuanced stuff there that, that you may or may not know. So, that's a thing to do. Um, hi, Robin in Arizona. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't necessarily have a three strike rule for judges. Honestly, Renee, um, I have, I'll show them different styles of dogs. Um, if I can't win with anything, I'll go to them and say, what <laughs> an ass, right? Um, I think that it, it's mostly my experience is that it is the dog on the day and that it can be sometimes hard to swallow. I had a judge I respected tremendously, absolutely admired this man, gave me a group one on a pug special. Um, and I was so honored and I was so excited when I saw him coming up on a panel 
And the next time he had him, I can't remember if he beat him in the breed, maybe. Um, he did not give him another group one, let's put it that way. And I was just, I was so just devastated. I was like, oh my God. And I went and asked him, I'm like, why, why? I mean, like, I wrote you a nice note. You wrote me a nice note. Why? <laughs> and um, it boiled down to the dog on the day. Dog didn't perform that day the way he had the other day. And, you know, I mean, that's a thing. So I just think it's important to everybody keep in mind. Um, okay, cool. Next up in our list of things that we're going to talk about in I'm, I'm brand new to the dog show. I don't know what to do or where to go with. There've been just for some reason, just a rash of conversations about clothing. Oh, here's a good one. Hang on. We're going to do clothing in a minute. I want to answer Ian's question because it's a really good question. Um, do you do anything to help give dogs some extra energy for group after a long day or a long cluster? That is a fabulous question. And the answer is yes. The thing I do not give them is NutraCal. That is pure sugar. It will give them a quick jolt and they'll be down and then they'll be lower than they were. Um, I love bee pollen. Bee pollen is something that you can feed in a pill form. Um, I think some of the places you can find it in a, in a, um, like a paste form, but basically a pill you give it to him. It's not an instant energy boost, but it is a good stamina builder. And I really, 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 really like that. Um, lots of people have little tricks, many of which are not all that great for the dog. Um, so I really encourage sticking with something that builds stamina rather than something that is, um, like an instant sugar boost. It's, it's just really not good for the dogs. Um, exercise, conditioning, keeping the dogs cool on hot dog shows, giving them rest breaks, not making them stand on a table for two hours, you know, not walking them all around the dog show, being considerate of your dog basically is, is one of the best things and knowing your dog and what their exact tolerance is because no dog is the same. And I'll give you a perfect example and you'll appreciate this. So yes, bee pollen, hundred percent. Um, I had two different specials, two different breeds, opposite ends of the spectrum. Unbelievably. So my first best in show dog was a clumber spaniel and he, he liked to show, he thought it was okay, but he had his attention span and his stamina were about like, you know, so he's a clumber. And so he would walk in the group ring at the end of the line stand up for the judge to look down the line. And then we'd go and we'd lay in the corner and he'd lay with his little cool towel over his, and he would take a nap and he would just snooze for that 20 minutes or whatever it was going to be until it was his turn to be examined, do his down and back. And then it was basically time to be on the line and, you know, get pointed at. And it was wonderful. He, he was great. If I tried to keep him up and, and performing for that whole 20 minutes, by the time it was counting, there'd be nothing left. So that was him. The other end of the spectrum was the wire hair pointer who was very successful. Her name was smoke. And if I didn't let her allow her to stand up, free stack, show off, wag her tail, be a show dog for the entire group, she would get mad and she'd quit. She'd be like giant paw. So know your dog know what they need and, and cater to them, not to what you think they ought to do or what you think the perceived opinion is of what they ought to do. Pay attention to your dog. They're the only one that counts. What everybody else thinks doesn't matter. So that's my, that's my two cents on that, but yes, to be pollen, no to NutraCal. Okay. Now clothing. And I don't know why this is suddenly such a hot button topic. I don't know what's gotten into people, but as much as it's nice to have, you know, our casual day dog shows, which we have wolf stock coming up. I'm so excited. I've got ripped up jeans and peasant tops in my suitcase. I'm just dying. I'm so excited. Right. Okay. That's not every day. Every day is understanding that yes, this is a game we play and in the game we play appearances matter and our appearances matter as well as the dogs. 
And I'm not saying you need to be out there in a Brooks Brothers suit and a and a button down shirt and a and a six hundred dollar mess tag on a hundred and five degree day. What I am saying is that just because you're comfortable in in leggings and that's what you'd like to show your dogs in, doesn't mean that's a good idea. And it has nothing to do with body image, body shaming, body anything. Doesn't have anything to do with whether I think it's cool or not cool that you have 50 million tattoos. I don't care, right? What I care about is that people who want to play the game have a little respect. And I don't need for it to be, again, not everybody has to be in a St. John. Not everybody should be. (laughs) Um, But find your style. Make it work for you. Be clean. Be comfortable. Be presentable. Do not distract from the dog. I mean, that's that's pretty basic. And that, that gives you a lot of leeway. Clean, comfortable, professional. Don't distract distract from the dog. Fill in the blanks. If you're comfortable in a nice pair of slacks, go with that. Um, you know, the, the vest, uh, trend is really big here on the West coast. The women handlers like to wear vests and that's a very comfortable way to have pockets and great, whatever works. Um, it long gone are the days that, that, uh, everybody was dressed to the nines in their pillbox hats and, and, the only time we do that is every five years at Morrison Essex. So, you know, I, I we've already stepped it down a notch. I don't believe that every dog show we should get to be showing in jeans and a t-shirt as comfortable as that is. So there's my two cents worth for what it's worth. And y'all can come at me if you want. Um, okay. Great for keeping the dogs cool. John Tay. Um, so the very best things that you can do in a hot environment, chamois claws that you put in an ice has got ice and water in it. Get the dog, <clears throat> get the chamois wet, put it on the, on the dog's feet, the dog's belly, the dog's ears, the dog's groin, a fan. Everybody needs to have themselves a Ryobi fan. If you don't have one, it's Ryobi days at Home Depot. Last I heard, um, And then in a real serious emergency, if you have rubbing alcohol, you can put, if the dog is actually in, um, and uh, in trouble, right. Is, is got a uh, heat exhaustion or something along those lines, rubbing alcohol on their pads, on their belly and on their underneath of their ears. Remember that dogs don't sweat. The only way they have to dissipate heat is to pant the, putting a, a cool coat over the top of the dog is rarely as useful as we like to th- make ourselves feel good and think it is. The best thing that we can do is put that cool chamois or a wet towel on the grass or on the floor and have the dog stand with it so their pads are wet. This also has the advantage of making the dog's pads um, more grippy when you're running in dry grass or on mats or on carpet or any other place. Um, hot, dry days, the dog's pads dry out and they don't, when the dog's pads are dry, they slip and they don't move as well. They don't stand up as well. So damp pads keeps the dog cool, gives them better traction. Um, fans, water, ice, shade. Um, I will tell you, um, I, my judgy judge voice is going to come out now. Um, if you don't have shade and some judges are not as cognizant as they should be. You are in charge of your dog's well-being. If you don't make shade or you don't make shade, you can put yourself between the dog and the sun. I have done it and, and I know it's not comfortable. Trust, trust me. I know it's not comfortable, but that's not the point, right? The point is keeping our dogs comfortable. So worst case scenario, shade the dog with your own body. That is the, to me, indicator of a good, talented, respectful, serious dog person of any stripe. Um, yes, we're the cost of a dog handler. I like that, Ian. That's a super great way to think about it. Um, yes, Brenda, 100% don't walk dogs on hot pavement or asphalt or even dry grass, frankly. Um, it, I, 
I am absolutely insane about people walking dogs on hot surfaces. It makes me crazy. Um, I also have been known on more than one occasion to pull a dog from a show that was for that individual animal too hot. Um, I, two examples again, went best in show with a pug dog in Wisconsin. The temperature was 105 on the thermometer and it was about 85% humidity. If you see the photo of it, I look like I've been dipped in oil. And um, the judge told me at the time, one of the reasons the dog won was because he went around the ring with his mouth shut, never panted the whole way around the ring at the end of the show. And I put a lot of effort into making that be the case. So, you know, that's a thing. Another time uh, where her pointer special that was not as good a show dog, not as comfortable in the heat, didn't want to be there anyway. I, I refused to show him. He'd won a big specialty and the group was a big deal and it was a good judge. And I said, no. And the co-breeder co-owner was really mad at me. And I said, I really don't care. Um, I'm not going to do that to this dog. So again, pay attention to your dogs. Know what matters in the scheme of life. Um, favorite bait. Oh man, all kinds of stuff. Um, I don't, I don't think I'm getting all our comments. So I really always, there used to be a thing called great bait, um, here in the Northwest. You can't find it. I don't think anymore. Um, but it was wonderful. It was basically, um, ground up liver boiled and pressed into little bars. It was just the handiest stuff in the world. Um, if you're going to use liver, uh, use liver. That's pretty well, I do boiled and then baked right? So that, so that there's good, um, texture and it's not slimy. Um, uh, just boiled or cooked chicken is really pretty useful. Um, and again, it's going to depend on the dog. I had a clumber that was famously violently allergic to liver. Um, and there are plenty of Dalmatians that can't eat chicken and I mean, you name it, right? So pick your poison. Um, my one clumber loved jelly beans. He would be you would bait for jelly beans. I mean, it just depends on the dog. Um, but generally speaking, chicken was always my favorite, usually the less stomach, up, least stomach upset. Um, and always remember, we're not out there to feed the dog a meal, right? Um, bait is to be used not to make your dog stand still, not to do any of those things. Bait is for in an emergency at the end of your down and back, you can't get ears, you whip out the piece of bait and you are rewarding a job well done, not shoving it in their mouth to get them to stand there. That's another one of my personal pet peeves. Um, using food to train your dog means that you actually train the dog and you don't need to shove food in their mouth for them to do the job. Sorry. Um, spray water bottles are fabulous. Absolutely, Robin. Um, I like having a mist of water um, both for their pads, uh, for their ears, if need be for their testicles. Um, if it's a boy dog, that sort of thing. Um, I love, I love me a spray bottle of water. Um, oh, great question, Janet. If your inexperienced dog wins the breed, should you opt out of going to the group? Well, I think that really depends. Okay. So is your inexperienced dog also nervous? or unsure, or is it just an experienced? If it's just an experienced, it needs the experience and taking it to the group ring with, you know, set low expectations, go have a good time, just relax and have fun with your dog. I think that's a really positive thing, right? If you can take your nerves out of it and write and just take the dog and have fun, I think that's a great thing. If your dog is very uncertain, very nervous, already noise sensitive, any of those sorts of things, then yes, I think it is absolutely worth opting out. It is hundred percent depends on the dog and the situation in that, in that instance. Yes. Bait and moderation is a thing. Um, Swedish fish. I haven't tried that. Although I did have somebody have like dried minnows or something in my ring the other day. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of icky. <laughs> um, I have seen some people use um, not the little dried minnows, but I have seen people use like a salmon jerky kind of thing that seemed like it was pretty good for the dogs. It's stunk, stinky 
for the dogs that just won't bait for just anything that seemed to be useful. Um, on the topic of bait, Avery asks, is it a good idea to use a toy as bait? Um, okay. So my answer to almost everything, it depends. <laughs> um, if you're going to use a squeaky, right? Like a little furry rat squeaky thing, train your dog with it before you get to the dog show, right? So all you have to do is show it to them and they're happy. If you have to squeak it or worse, squeak it a lot, you might find yourself on the receiving ends of some death glares. Because the thing that you need to balance is showing your dog to its best while not distracting other dogs um, and, and, and causing them to have a poor experience. So I think toys are great. Lots of dogs out there that have no, you know, food drive that are going to just do backflips for a fluffy rabbit or a fluffy rat or whatever it is. Um, and I have no problem with it, but train it at home so that you, if you have to squeak it, it's once and not incessantly. Okay. But yes, hundred percent toys are cool. Okay, you guys, oddly enough, I have managed to jack my jaws for an hour nonstop. <clears throat> crazy, crazy talk. I am so grateful. Yeah, small piece lasted all weekend. I can believe that, Tony. That salmon jerky is harsh. Um, oh, interesting. So Robin's, Robin's commentary was fake tossing. So tossing bait is a topic. Um, it is a huge topic. It is almost a topic for its own event, but just here, we're going to say, if you feel the need to throw bait, pick it up. If you are not going to pick it up, throw it out of the ring and have someone else pick it up. If you're going to throw it out of the ring, try really hard not to hit anybody in the audience with it because they get a little grouchy. Mostly try not to have to throw bait. And if you throw bait, pick it up. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. I have, I have a litter that we're whelping for friends that's due any second. So I'm going to have to hop off of here. Thank you all. Thank everybody for joining us tonight. It was great to have you all here. Thanks for the folks that joined me, Ian and Natalie. I appreciate you guys so much. I have a really quick pitch, okay, for a friend of the show, Fido, um, and most of you are going to be familiar with uh, Fido, the nonprofit organization dedicated to feeding pets for people who are down on their luck. It's organized by my dear friend, Nancy Martin. They do unbelievable work for folks in, here in Oregon, and they're working on doing this around the country. They have a fundraiser set up in which you can download an app use their seller number. All of this is going to be coming in the comments right now. Um, and you can shop for popcorn and cheese and all kinds of yummy snacks. Fido gets a portion of the proceeds and you get the tasty snacks. I mean, winner, winner, chicken dinner, right? Um, so go do that. Nancy works really, really hard. She counts on the purebred dog people to help the people who are not as fortunate as we are. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for helping out a friend and we will catch you next month. Oh, super quick, super quick side note. The first Tuesday in July is wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Drum roll fireworks, the 4th of July. So sadly we will be moving this to Wednesday, July 5th. I hate to do it. I hate going off schedule, but I see no point in having us trying to do this when people are trying to go to 4th of July parades and have picnics and all that kind of good stuff. So Wednesday, July 5th, our next live at five. And hopefully if the, if the gods smile on me, we will have a super cool guest to join us for that event. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate you guys joining us and we'll catch you next time on live at five. <laughs>